Euh, mesdames et messieurs de la presse, je vous souhaite les bienvenus à la conférence de presse sur le rapport sur le commerce et le développement 2021 de la CNUSED. La conférence de presse va maintenant continuer en anglais. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the press conference on the launch of the Trade and Development Report 2021 with the title From Recovery to Resilience, the Development Dimension. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Arlette Verplug and I head communications and external relations in UNCTAD. We have with us the Secretary General of UNCTAD, Ms. Rebecca Greenspan, who will take the floor, after which, followed by the Director of the Division on Globalization and uh, Development Strategies, Mr. Richard Kozel Wright, and both will remain at the end for questions and answers. It is now with great honor that I give the floor to our new Secretary General, Mrs. Greenspan. Secretary General, please. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear friends. I cannot emphasize enough how excited I am being here with you, launching this Trade and Development Report 2021. Year after year, we know that this report really is a contribution to research and and, and to the world, and uh, this is not the exception. So thank you very much for the whole team, to the whole team, for all the effort during all these years, but especially now in 2021. Uh, I think I have missed only but a few of UNCTAD's TDRs since uh, 1981, <laughs> uh, a time when I was I, an economics professor at the University of Costa Rica, and my career was only starting. UNCTAD's trade and development reports have accompanied me ever since. So it really is a great honor to be here today. That said, I must confess something. I only started this job yesterday. <laughs> so I won't pretend to know all the details about the report, but the Richard is here to do so. So, uh, I, uh, before giving the floor to Richard, I would like to uh, share with you today a reaction to some of the key findings of uh, this report. Uh, as this report describes, after one of the deepest and most damaging recessions last, last year, at an expected 5.3% uh, global GDP growth for 2021, we are at the midst of one of the most robust economic recoveries in the last 50 years. But let me be, be very clear, this 5.3% number is simply the average of an increasingly and worryingly divergent economic trajectory, marked by great and rising inequality, both within and between countries. As I have always said, when uh, you are in a situation in a world of high inequalities, averages often hide more than they reveal. And they really are hiding the huge asymmetries that we are facing today. While many rich world economies are already above their pre-pandemic level, developing regions will only regain their pre-COVID GDP per capita by at best at the end of next year, or at worst, 2024. This is doubly concerning, given a, a, a doubly concerning, sorry, given the enormous setbacks in development metrics and poverty, a, in the combat against poverty and inequalities that we witnessed last year, and that happened precisely in developing countries. In Latin America alone, if you have seen the numbers, we have regressed two decades in extreme poverty and uh, in, in rising inequality is as we have uh, never seen. So given in country dynamics, even if the South recovers economically by 2022 or 2023, their social metrics might not recover until years after that because we know very well that we go, when we go in the downturn uh, uh, part of the curve uh, in the recession, poverty and inequality increase a lot. And when we recover, 
poverty and inequality recover very slowly. So even if we recover in economic terms, in social terms, there will pass a lot of years with the hanging of the consequences of the pandemic. In the South, it is often the rule, as I said, that when the times are good, they are even better for the wealthy. And when the times are bad, they are even worse for the poor. In Latin America, for example, the lost economic decade of the 80s were in reality two lost decades in the social front. The prospect of that happening again in this, uh, the decade of action towards meeting the SDGs that was supposed to be the decade of action to meet the SDGs is very concerning. The reasons behind this divergent recovery are very clear, and we have been warning against them for a while now. There are many, but I would like to highlight two. First, vaccines. The numbers here couldn't be clearer. To date, only 2% of the population of the least developed countries has been vaccinated against COVID-19, a rate that is just one-tenth of the vaccination rate of other developing, developing countries and a fraction of the vaccination rate of developed countries. We can not even calculate it because there are too many, too many zeros. <laughs> Last week, we heard the terrible news that COVAX will decrease by 25% its target of vaccine donations this year at a time when many countries are already take, talking about booster shots and there will be unexpected one billion glad of a new doses in G7 countries by the end of this year. Our report proposes many solutions to this issue and obviously Richard will talk about that later. The second reason is that while expansionist policies are being implemented in the developed countries, the developing world faces severe constraints and run the risk to be forced to austerity measures too soon. As our report describes, there has been a new found appreciation of the role of the state in society, an idea that ANCTAD has always championed. We are seeing now extremely accommodative monetary policies and huge fiscal packages utilized by countries with currencies reserve status. In the meantime, developing regions whose spending packages were but a fraction are already having to cut back some of their spending and increase their interest rates in reaction to the fears of increasing inflation increasing debt ratios, and the prospect of a new adverse cycle in financial markets. Another of the big asymmetries that this pandemic has put us in front of. There are many other issues the report deals with, including the increasing disparity between financial market performance and the real economy, the structural gaps of QE policies, that they, the QE, QE policies have produced in the developing world, amongst others. But before I finish, I would like to highlight two more things. First, on special drawing rights, the SDRs. Our report welcomes the 650 billion emission of SDRs, which took place last, last month. However, as we know, about 40% of this emission will be full on G7 countries who do not need them. We need to work together towards new financing mechanisms and push for the voluntary session or no or on lending of unused SDRs towards the developing world. There are currently many discussions take, taking place at the IMF, the World Bank, the G20, the G7, on what is the best way to do this. ANCTAD needs to take part in these conversations, given its mandate and its consensus building muscle in the Global South. Let us remember that it was in ANCTAD that SDRs were first discussed and proposed over 50 years ago. There is great historic opportunity to galvanize this momentum 
around the SDRs to close some of the structural gaps in the international monetary system and the global financial markets. The second and last point I would like to make is to underline what I think to be the report's central message. As I mentioned, the world has rediscovered the role and the importance of the state. This is most welcome development after years of policies that have failed the poor and the middle classes, not only in the developing world, but also in advanced economies. But the question remains, what to do with the rediscovered state? We need to reach a new consensus, a consensus that envisions a state that innovates, that builds industrial capacity, that facilitates human formation, human capital formation. That takes note of the successful experiences of some Asian countries that have followed this road to escape the middle income trap. A consensus that will rebalance the power in the roles of the market and the state. I cannot emphasize enough the risk of not reaching a consensus. We need to negotiate our way into this historic opportunity, and I think ANCTAD is uniquely positioned to do that. I will now yield the floor to Richard, who will go more into details on this most urgent and important report. Thank you very much. Rebecca, thank you very much. Um, for someone who has only just jumped into the job, you said a lot of the things that I would have said anyway, uh, which might, makes my task a little easier. Let me just, uh, you, you all have the press releases, you've all had copies of the report. So let me draw out a few of the uh, larger issues that we have tried to articulate this year. I should say, by way of an introduction, a couple of points. This is a 40th anniversary of the Trade and Development Report. So, so we felt we needed to, um, in a way, celebrate that uh, in, in this report, because I think a lot of what we've been trying to say over that period um, has come to a head, really, in the context of the COVID-19. It's, it's not so much patting ourselves on the back, but I think it is a, it is a recognition that the work that has been done by colleagues well before me, um, does re deserve uh, uh, the kind of attention and respect that I think I think we're getting. Uh, second point: there will be a there, there is a, a, a group of chapters that link to the theme of resilience, which is central to this year's report on climate adaptation. We will be releasing those chapters later to coincide essentially with the forthcoming COP, where we expect the issue of climate adaptation to be um, a major one in the negotiations in Glasgow. So um, you will get another round of chapters of the Trade and Development Report uh, later this month or early in October uh, for a launch uh, 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 next month. I, I wanna really just kind of do, I think, uh, uh, three things in my comments. Um, we are 18 months after the WHO um, announced a pandemic uh, as a consequence of the spread of the COVID-19 virus. Um, and I just want to say something about what we have learned over that period. Um, what's on the horizon, both this year and, and into 2022. And, and also what we, we are trying to about the need to build back, which has become the refrain of choice for many policymakers particularly in the West, but I think it captures the feeling that we cannot repeat the mistakes that we made after the global cri uh, financial crisis and that we need to do something differently uh, in response to this crisis if we're going to build a more resilient and more inclusive and more sustainable future. So let me just uh, say that a lot of, I think, in terms of what we learned, Rebecca has already, I think, very clearly articulated. Um, the world was remarkably unprepared for this shock. Uh, that, I think that's a lesson that we take. And that's not just true of developing countries. It's true of many developed countries as well. Um, obviously, there, are, there has been variation uh, across that, uh, uh, across both the developed and the developing countries. But the world was unprepared. And that should be a real warning for us. This was a trial run. The kinds of shocks that we are likely to see over the next decade are going to be more serious than COVID-19. And the lack of preparedness is something that has come out, I think, of this uh, crisis and it's something that we worry about extensively 
again, just to reiterate what Rebecca said, the, we, we know we've been living through a very divided world, uh, a very unequal world, a very insecure world. The, the COVID-19 crisis has, has both exposed that once again and to some extent exaggerated uh, those divisions. The asymmetries are big within and across countries. Um, the South is particularly vulnerable to the kinds of shocks that we've seen and the, poverty, the, the, the successes that we've seen in terms of poverty alleviation uh, over years really since the early 2000s have in many cases been wiped out in a matter of weeks or months and that's in a sense is a measure of the fragility of the global economy uh, right now um, and and the state matters I, I don't need to repeat repeat what Rebecca said I think everyone has come to the recognition that the demonization of the state over the last two or three decades has proved to be very unhelpful in the face of the kind of shock uh, that we that we've seen um, I think on a positive side, it's also become clear that governments are not locked into a one-size-fits-all uh, policy agenda. When push came to shove, the advanced economies did things that were 180 degree different from what they claimed to have been doing over the previous two or three uh, uh, decades. And, 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 and that's, I think, a, 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 an important lesson to take from the crisis. But again, we've been exposed to the greater challenges that the state faces in the developing world, given particularly the external constraints that they, that they face. And I think in that context, as we think about the, re, the, the reinvention of the state uh, over the coming years, how that links to the multilateral system. The multilateral system, I have to say, has not come out in glowing colors as a consequence of this crisis. Um, we, we've talked about COVAX and the, and, and, and the reliance essentially on charity by advanced economies and to some extent large pharmaceutical companies has not delivered the kind of vaccines that the developing world needs. The initiatives of the G20, whilst welcome and important steps, have not been on the scale that we need. I think the special drawing rights initiative uh, that, that Rebecca talked about is a very important step forward. But we, we do need to see more ambition along those lines if we're going to create a multilateral environment that can uh, deliver a resilient and robust, not just a recovery, but a, 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 a decade of, of, of sustainable development. In terms of just the next 18 months, how, how the report um, sees uh, that evolving, um, there has been a strong global recovery this year. A lot of that is a technical rebound from the sharp decline in 2020, uh, but fiscal activism has contributed to a 5.3% uh, growth rate. Trade will grow even more quickly. 9.5% is the estimate that we have in the report for this year, but it has been incredibly uneven, um, particularly uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and parts of Asia have not seen the kind of recovery uh, the, that we, we would have hoped to see and, and that they need. Uh, but even within the advanced economies, there's huge differences between the US and, and Germany or Japan that are, have recovered uh, much more uh, slowly. So, so this uneven quality of the recover, recovery is something that is of ongoing concern. And that's, uh, that's reflected in differences within countries. The COVID-19 pandemic has hit women, uh, people of color, uh, low-income people far harder than people at the top of the income. Uh, of the income ladder and, and that needs to be addressed if we're going to live up to our commitment to a, a building back together uh, agenda. Um, what will matter we think over the next 18 months of course is the policy choices that particularly advanced countries make in terms of building on, on this recovery and recognizing the challenges that uh, developing countries face and helping them uh, to recover uh, uh, better. Um, we warn endlessly in this report about a return to business as usual policies, the kinds of policies that we saw after the global financial crisis did not deliver strong growth. They, uh, they delivered uh, a large dose of inequality and they produced a fragile um, uh, uh, economic situation that the COVID-19 uh, crisis has further exaggerated. Uh, we think we are, we are concerned that the recent um, discussion about inflationary pressures is being overemphasized. Um, uh, 
this is not a macroeconomic problem, it's a mismatch problem, a disconnect between the supply uh, uh, and the demand sides of the economy. We see that with the challenges that uh, certain supply chains are facing and the impact that has on prices. We see it in sectoral pressures with some sectors growing much more quickly than others, and that is leading to uh, certain types of supply bottlenecks. We see it, of course, with commodity prices, which have recovered strongly um, uh, this year across most uh, sectors. Um, but again, it, it's a reflection much more of, of um, uh, structural uh, weaknesses than it is of macroeconomic pressures. That is not to say they're not important. In the particular case of food prices, there are real concerns that we express in the report about the dangers that that is causing uh, in, in a number of developing country regions, particularly in Latin America, but not only in, 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 in the Latin, Latin American uh, region. And there are also exchange rate pressures um, that are leading, uh, fe feeding into uh, inflationary pressures in some parts of the developing world. But this is not 19, this is not the 1970s. This is not a stagflationary threat of the kind that we saw in the 1970s. When we look at uh, uh, inflationary expectations, when we look at the possibility of a wage price spiral, we don't see the same kinds of problems that we saw in the 1970s. And we do worry that this talk could lead to a premature uh, removal of some of the necessary expansionary policies that have been adopted in both developed and developing countries and need to continue if the recovery is going to be sustained and inclusive in, in, a, in a meaningful way. There is an issue behind that the report raises about the ongoing influence of uh, the financial sector on policy making, particularly in the advanced economies. That's a long standing concern that we have expressed in the report. And unlike the global financial crisis, there has been very little talk this time around of the need to re regulate the financial uh, sector. And that's, a, and that's an, a position that we think is a necessary one for a more stable and long lasting uh, recovery. And, and we have been disappointed with the lack of attention this time around to uh, the, the question of financial uh, reform. We do in the report um, look at a comparison, we do make a comparison between the global financial crisis and the uh, uh, COVID-19 crisis. And I think it's, it's, it's important to recognize that many parts of the developing world have been hit much harder uh, by the COVID-19 crisis in terms of lost output than they were after the global financial crisis. And that's particularly true of Sub-Saharan Africa, but it's also true of a number of par uh, parts of Asia other than East Asia, and to some extent, South Asia. So, so uh, you know, uh, the, the, the scale of, I think, I think we are worried about the complacency to some extent of advanced economies as they have recovered, as they've rolled out their vaccines successfully, there simply has not been enough attention to the long lasting damage that the uh, crisis uh, is causing in the developing world. And, and, and that bodes badly for our worry, which we expressed last year, that de the developing countries could face another lost decade uh, uh, if, if the international community does not find the necessary support, a decade where we had hoped, given the SDGs and the Agenda 2030, there would be a kind of change of uh, 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 ambition for the international community to really step up to the plate and meet the kinds of ambitious goals that were em em embedded in that. And that's before we get to the climate crisis, which we know uh, uh, is, is now... Uh, uh, much closer than many people feared after the IPCC report. And unless we rein in reckless finance, we find it very difficult to see where the resource, the mobilization of resources is going to come from for the kind of long-term sustained investment in both mitigation and adaptation uh, to meet the goals that we have uh, uh, set ourselves. Um, there is an, um, I think it's important to, to emphasize the positives that have come out of this, of this crisis. And that's particularly, obviously it's true of the advanced economies. They have been much more successful in coordinating their monetary and their fiscal policies in a way that has produced the kind of um, uh, recoveries 
uh, that we've seen and and we it's an argument that we have been making in the report for some time now and and we've been encouraged by that we've been encouraged by their the embrace of a more eclectic policy agenda, the role of industrial policy, for example, has, has been acknowledged by a number of countries, not least, uh, not least the new administration in the United States, as part of a necessary uh, package of, of policy measures to build back better. So uh, th there are real encouraging signs that we emphasize in the report. Um, but again, the, the disconnect between that and what's going on in, this, in the developing world needs to be emphasized. The squeezing of fiscal space in the developing world um, is a major, a major problem. The fact that developing country uh, monetary institutions do not have the degrees of freedom that advanced country central banks have to adopt a more expansionary monetary policy has been uh, exposed once again because of the external constraints that developing countries face. They don't have the same kind of policy space that is enjoyed by advanced economies and that needs to be addressed and, and the special drawing rights is an important step in that direction but, but I think the, particularly with respect to the burden of debt, we do need to see more ambition when it comes to uh, solving that problem. Uh, it's something that recent reports have, have emphasized very strongly that the burden of debt in many developing countries, particularly uh, the low income, but also middle income countries, makes it almost prohibitive to deliver the SDGs without some kind of debt relief and indeed debt cancellation in some countries. And going back to that issue and the multilateral challenges that poses, we think again, is gonna be important to any kind of building back uh, a, a better agenda. Um, we, are, we are cognizant that the kind of debt crisis that could have happened this year has not materialized in the developing world. That's partly due to a reflux of capital flows to some emerging markets. It's partly due, it, uh, it's partly due to the rise of commodity prices in, in some heavily de uh, uh, indebted uh, developing countries. It's partly, I think, due to the special drawing rights discussion, making uh, ex uh, 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 international investors slightly more confident about some emerging market uh, economies. But none of these are permanent. And in many respects, we uh, suggest that there's been a kicking the can down the road when it comes to the debt challenge. And again, there needs to be a systematic addressing of this problem if, if, the, if, if, if these crises are not simply to return in, in uh, 12 or 18 months, uh, 18 months time. Um, be, and, and, and so those are some of the key messages, I think, from this year's report. In terms of looking beyond the next 18 months and the question of resilience um, and building more uh, resilience, um, again, we emphasize the need not to go back to business as usual policies, and we indeed model the, the, possibility, the consequences of that which clearly show that developing countries will be the most damaged if we return to the kinds of policies we saw after the after the global uh, financial uh, uh, crisis um, there is a reform agenda that we i think we try we see a reform agenda emerging particularly again particularly in the biden administration which is encouraging um, and 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 when we look at the efforts that have been made in terms of responding to the inequality challenge, in terms of responding to the growing dominance and distortion of very large corporations with undue market power, in terms of the uh, climate agenda and the commitment to, to investing in climate mitigation. There are positives to be taken from the last 18 months. I guess our message is that this, this is necessary but not sufficient so there is there needs to be a real ratcheting up of ambition on all those fronts particularly in the advanced economies the advanced economies still set the agenda for the rest of the world and if they are if they seriously begin to tackle their own inequalities their own abuse of market power their own limitations when it comes to climate mitigation i think that will set the kind of standard for the uh, for the rest of the world to follow um, but so far, they are not doing enough. And I think that has to be a strong message that comes out of this report that goes, of, of course, to the discussions in the COP. We have articulated in recent reports 
the notion of a global green new deal as a way of both addressing the climate problem and the underlying inequities and injustices that have emerged over decades in in, in the advanced economies we want we want their green new deals to go global essentially and i think that remains a message um, that we that we that we have in this report let me leave it there i'll let um, open it for questions Thank you, Richard. So we will now turn to questions. In the meantime, I want to remind everybody that the report is under embargo until tomorrow, uh, Wednesday, 15 September, 2 p.m. GMT and 4 p.m. Uh, Geneva time. So I see already we have Laurent Sierra of Swiss News. Uh, Laurent, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you for taking my question. Secretary General, uh, congratulations and, and good luck for your mandate. Um, you mentioned the, the need for UNCTAD to be asso associated to the most important discussions uh, uh, to take place in order to bid back better. Um, what will be your plan to engage with the different stakeholders and how will you expand the exposure of the key components uh, that UNCTAD want to, to convey? Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you very much. Well, first, uh, we are on the on the final days to UNCTAD 15, and no doubt UNCTAD 15 has to stay very clearly. Uh, the areas where UNCTAD has been working all these years, this is not a new thing. As I said, uh, 50 years ago, UNCTAD was already working on the SDRs. It was uh, really an UNCTAD idea, if I am not mistaken. <laughs> uh, the, the thing now is to, to, to really discuss how we will uh, connect the, 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 the SDRs, for example, or the new financial instruments to development. And that continues to be the question. It was a question then, it continues to be a question now. And I think that the development side of the discussion in terms of a financial, new financial mechanisms or facilities for the developing countries to be able to get out of this crisis uh, with less pain, with the less poverty, with the less inequality is still UNCTAD's UNCTAD business because it's a development question. It's not only a macroeconomic question. It's not only a monetary policy question. It's a development question. And UNCTAD has always had a voice in, in, in those issues and it has to continue having one. Now, the I, I think that what we have to build together is the space where we can really find together uh, new solutions. And that space, I ask everybody, where, where is it? Where is it that the, the developing world and the developed world were, will discuss these issues, trying to find a, a common project? And I think that UNCTAD is a perfectly well-suited place to do that. So that will be my, a, 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 my task and my objective to convince to create a space for trust, not uh, for total agreement, but for trust to discuss openly issues that are of vital important, importance, not only for the South, but on, also for the North. If we want a more stable, a more peaceful, and um, a more pr prosperous world. Um, there's a next question from Ravi Kant Devarakonda. If you could please state also for which agency you work. Can you hear me, madam? Can you hear me? Yeah? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. My name is Ravi Kant. I write for The Sons. I write for several other publications. Uh, uh, I have two questions. First to the Secretary General and second to Richard Causal Wright. Uh, Madam Secretary General, congratulations for taking over this very challenging job at a very critical time uh, because UNCTAD for the last several years has lost its raison d'etre. It does not know what it needs to do, even though the organization was set up 
uh, with very noble intentions, which had continued until very recently. There is a, there seems to be a capture of your organization by the group B countries and their agendas. Having heard you just now, uh, it's very uh, encouraging and challenging, uh, uh, challenging objectives that you have set up. How would you actually uh, do things on the say waiver trips waiver front? Would you support it? Uh, because it is a demand which is made by about 68 countries from Global South, including Australia, which has just joined now. Ongtad's uh, stand on this has been uh, very vacillating here. It hasn't taken any formal position. Uh, how would you uh, treat the vaccine waiver, the TRIPS vaccine waiver? And secondly, how would you... Uh, 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 take up the agenda of the global south, uh, you know, in, which has not been heard by the previous UNCTAD secretary generals in uh, what you had set out, namely a place in the dialogue on the new SDRs and the new financial uh, arrangements. Uh, so these are two main questions. There are more, but uh, I'll I'll just ask, like to ask Richard uh, something about the report, namely the report very rightly captures about the growth that has taken place from the very low figures of last year, but uh, the challenges is, uh, remain. Uh, the financial sector seems to be the major problem and uh, without uh, some reform of this global financial architecture uh, in which UNCTAD has to play a major role, how would you actually uh, implement most of your, uh, or how do you plan to take up most of your challenges? Thank you, madam. And Ravi. Ravi. Ah. Uh, thank you, Ravi. Very easy questions. <laughs> uh, well, with respect to, to, to the vaccine and trips, I am part of the movement for a universal vaccine, and that that I have been very clear on this. And uh, I know that there is no agreement. There is no agreement between the developed world either, <laughs> or the advanced economies. They, there are different positions in here. Uh, and I, I would say that there are uh, uh, good arguments in both uh, camps. And I will take the, the argument of the uh, um, uh, waiver on the intellectual property rights for the vaccines to be able to expand the productive capacity. And I think that that design can be very important. I understand also that to expand the productive capacity, the only thing you need to do is not only to a, a, the waiver on the intellectual property rights. You need other things because you need technology transfer, you need knowledge transfer. It's not something that it can be done in five minutes. But I think that it will be a good start to be able to do that. And, uh, and I think that more and more, we, we continue to, to see that. If my, the numbers I gave are correct, I, 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 I plea they are, if it, uh, Many of the least developed countries only have 2% of vaccination, so we won't have a post-pandemic world. And that's something that we should all work for, to have a post-pandemic world. Now, we are not in a post-pandemic moment. Uh, the pandemic is still there. Variants will continue to, 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 to come if we don't vaccinate everybody. So. The saying that nobody's safe until we are all safe, it continues to be true. And if we don't expand productive capacity, uh, that we won't be able to meet the universal access to vaccines that we need, we need for a safer world. So that, that is my position. I have been in UNCTAD only today, so I cannot say what has been UNCTAD's <laughs> position on this. Uh, with respect to the agenda, uh, you ask also about the agenda of the Global South. And here I, I want to be very, very direct. I, I really believe that if the voice of the developing countries is heard, 
the decisions that will be taken will be better. If we are not in the table, in the decision making, if our voice is not heard, if the perspective from the developing world is not heard, the decisions that will be taken will be flawed. I am not saying we, we, have, we are the only ones that have uh, the truth or uh, the solutions. What I am saying is that without us, the solutions, will not be the good ones. And at least that uh, uh, position should be a reasonable one. <laughs> you know, if you want to make the world better without the developing part of the world, so probably <laughs> you will fail. And so what I think that the position that ANTA is taking is that we are an organization that I do a serious research on the positions from the perspective of the developing world. That perspective has to be on the table so we can get together to better solutions for everybody. They, if, if that won't be so, that will be a problem. So here, let me say, I am not going against one group or the other. I think that that is not the question. The question is, that we need to build a space where we can uh, uh, seriously discuss the problems that are problems that we all face, but that, that have different uh, connotations uh, depending on where are you. <laughs> and if we don't take that into account, if we don't take into account the inequalities and the asymmetries that we are living in the world, uh, we will continue to be in a crisis mode forever because we are not addressing properly the uh, main problems that the, that the world is facing. And certainly the SDGs, that is the only, together with, with the agreement on climate change, is the only uh, call for a world, the, uh, for, for a common project of humanity, let's put it that way, the SDGs represent that, and we won't achieve the SDGs and we won't be able to achieve uh, the necessary targets uh, to avoid the catastrophic effects of climate change if there isn't a, 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 common, a, 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 a common space for, uh, for uh, doing, uh, making that a reality. And uh, that, that is where I come from. So uh, going back, Ravi, to, to, to what you said, uh, I don't think that is a question of group A, B, C, or D. I think that is a question of being able to put forward really what this is about. This is about finding solutions for objectives that we all agreed on and that if for uh, the, making that happen, we don't have a space where our voice and our perspective from the developing world is heard, so uh, the agenda won't be achieved. Ravi, just in just a quick response to your um, question to me. UNCTAD has always maintained, I mean, it's kind of hardwired into our DNA that in an interdependent world, what is good for the South is actually the North too. And uh, health is set in all the connotations of that word, of that word, doesn't work in the end for the advanced economies too. They, they need a vibrant South. They need a South that is growing. They need a South that is an expanding markets for their own producers that offers reliable investment opportunities for their own investors. Uh, so that's all that that's a central tenet of the of the of UNCTAD thinking. Um, and and the, in that world, of course, we need strong, robust multilateral systems that support um, uh, developing countries. And we need good coordination across policies, particularly policies in the advanced economies, because of, as I said, they have a greater impact on opportunities elsewhere than than do most uh, other countries. And, th and that, I think that's particularly true of the financial system and 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 the way in which an unregulated financial system has wreaked havoc 
in the developing world, but also in the de in the developed world too, which, which we saw in 2009. I think, you know, is, is, a, is something that we need to reflect on. We need a different kind of narrative. And I think it's UNCTAD's job is not, we, we're not the IMF. We don't pretend to be, our job is not to implement or, uh, or, or to allocate resources. Uh, it's, to, it's to offer solutions to, uh, the problems of an interdependent world and one which in which over the last 30 decades finance has run amok to be quite frank and you know and, and that's what we've done historically i mean many of the innovative ideas around finance as, uh, including the special drawing rights story where UNCTAD was really hardwired into thinking how they could be used not simply as a tool of liquidity uh, injection, but as a developmental financing tool. We, we were hardwired into that. We were the institution that gave the world the 0.7% ODA uh, at, uh, target. We, we were the institution that first raised the issue of debt relief as a necessary element of a more stable uh, an interconnected global economy. I, I think. I think it's that, and 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 in a way, we're encouraged by things we're hearing from the IMF these days. Uh, you know, it's it's a strange world where uh, the head of the IMF lectures to developing countries that they need to spend more, because for thirty years they've been doing the opposite. And so when we hear that, that's something that we welcome. Um, uh, uh, when they call for more robust use of capital controls even reluctant even though they're reluctant to use the term but they're calling for it as a necessary part of a toolkit not not to be used indiscriminately or all, all the time but but to be there when uh, when 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 needed so you know i think our job is to push the international community into recognizing that these tools that are good for the south are not only good for the south but also good for a more a stable and resilient and, and dynamic global economy. Okay, and I see we have a next question from Isabel Sacco. If you could please mention the agency you represent. Good morning. I am Isabel Sacco for F Spanish News Agency. Uh, Señora Grispan, Grispan, um, le deseo uh, lo mejor en este nuevo encargo que, que empieza y le deseo también la bienvenida a Ginebra. Um, in the first few minutes of your remarks, uh, the sound and the image were, were in a stable, unstable. And I, I, um, I wonder if you could share with us uh, your remarks. Uh, through your media uh, media team, uh, this, uh, this is uh, my request. And my question is um, maybe to Mr. Kosul because it's a remark that he, that he he made. He said that in many parts of the uh, of the developing world, um, the developing world was uh, hit uh, in a more serious way by COVID crisis than in in relation or in comparison with what uh, it suffered during the financial crisis and i would like to know if he can uh, identify exactly which uh, regions of the world uh, the developing world were, were more uh, affected by this uh, this crisis now covid crisis because developing world is not the same so asia has not the same uh, tools for, for example, recovery, maybe that in Latin America or the other way around. Africa is different also. So if he can make a breakdown on the on the situation of his, if uh, every region and concerning Latin America, if he can also elaborate on what a, a Latin America would need to do to, to recover faster, because now we know that Poverty has increased a lot, as uh, Mrs. Grispan said. So, what are the maybe the tools, or there is there are no recipes. I know, but what is uh, what would be your concrete uh, recommendation to governments? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you, I think, in the press release the, that we circulated, you will find a breakdown of the regional comparison that we make between the two crises. I, I mean, and you will see from that that in particular, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, and I think West Asia, for example, were particularly hard hit uh, by this crisis in comparison uh, to the, uh, to the um, 
to the, uh, to the global financial crisis. And looking at the developing world as a whole, the crisis was uh, more, uh, the, the impact was more adverse uh, in this crisis in comparison to the other crisis. Um, so you, see, you will see a breakdown of the, uh, of the, the, the regional breakdown in the, in, in the press release and, and the report has a further elaboration uh, on, on, on that. Uh, I mean, Latin America, I mean, the impact to some extent was less in, in, in Latin America relative um, to the global financial crisis, partly because Latin America was doing much better in the decade before the global financial crisis than was the case in the decade after the global financial crisis. So Latin America, as, as Rebecca pointed out, has gone through a very difficult decade uh, after the global financial crisis. Uh, and, and so the drop has not been as dramatic, uh, the, the swing has not been as dramatic in Latin America uh, this time around as it was uh, after the crisis. I mean, in terms of, in terms of obviously very, you know, different countries in the region um, uh, require different um, responses and UNCTAD has always rejected a one size fits all type policy agenda uh, that has been uh, that has been pushed by the Washington institution so we're certainly not going to try and push a one size fits all agenda um, uh, coming uh, coming out of this uh, crisis uh, uh, obviously we at least from our point of view there needs to be a much more effective management of capital flows. Latin American economies are very vulnerable to the stop-go cycle of financial flows, and that has very detrimental impacts in terms of long-term sustainable growth, and there needs to be a better management uh, of, of, of those controls. That, that in, in, in one way or another, involves embracing the question of capital controls, I think, Many countries have been reluctant to do, but but we would certainly advise uh, an examination of of the possibilities to to bring about a more uh, a more stable financial environment. Uh, I think one of uh, a lot of Latin America over the last two decades has gone through a very rapid deindustrial what we would call premature, a premature deindustrialization process, and the need for uh, 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 returning to effective industrial policies, almost certainly different from those that were used in the 1950s and the 1960s, um, not as import, import substitution oriented, uh, more focused probably on exports than was the case in the past, but, but, but a real hard thinking about what kind of industrial strategy a middle-income country, and most Latin American countries are middle-income country, needs to be able to diversify their economies in ways that make them less vulnerable to the kinds of shocks we've seen, I think is a, in, an incredibly important part of the strategy. And that's work that UNCTAD has been doing with colleagues in Latin America now uh, for some time. And, and of course, in the case of the big economies, the need to focus on building up your own domestic markets uh, rather than simply relying on uh, external resources and markets, it remains an ongoing challenge. I mean, a country like Brazil has huge potential based on its own, the, the potential of its own domestic market and making sure that that is a vibrant market, worrying about uh, the robustness of uh, labor markets, making sure that informality is not uh, the, the prevalent way in which uh, markets are, uh, labor markets are structured. All these are critical, I think, to building up a, a more kind of robust um, uh, uh, economies in, in, in Latin America. So, so we would, we would th those are the kinds of measures that we have tried to articulate in the past. And I think the COVID-19 crisis has almost certainly uh, given, given them a, another lease of life. Um, because if Latin America is to to grow robust, robustly and inclusively uh, out of out of this crisis, I think they need to break with some of the policies that have been adopted over the course of the last three decades. Thank you. And I see Ravi has his hand up again. Ravi. Uh, Hello, can you hear me, madam? Yes, we do, thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, Secretary General, I still have a follow-up to your question, uh, your answers. 
namely two. Uh, one is in the TDR today, the one which has just now been released. Uh, uh, it has lent support to the, it has act, approved the waiver. So would I be wrong to write in my story that, uh, you know, you are not uh, sort of, you know, spelt out your position more clearly because uh, uh, the, the TDR report has uh, openly acknowledged and supported it as one of the best tools to fight the current crisis. The second question, madam, your, your UNTAD is primarily a policy think tank for the developing countries. Would you have any uh, serious role to play in terms of uh, putting out your views on the WTO reform agenda, where, for example, special and differential treatment is under serious attack and uh, several other things in the WTO. In the past, UNCTAD has been consistently providing progressive, I mean, support to developing country concerns uh, and putting out policy papers and positions. Would you also uh, plan to do anything of that kind? <laughs> uh, Ravi, yes, we support the waiver. I do personally, and it seems Angta too. <laughs> and uh, the second question, uh, I think that we have to provide uh, uh, research and knowledge for the developing countries to be in a better position to defend their interest in the trade negotiations. Uh, and I think that that's one of the uh, objectives and pillars of uh, of UNCTAD. It has been always, and it has to continue being so. With respect to the specifics, I am not still in a position to say in in which areas is where we have to concentrate our effort to provide uh, evidence and and knowledge for the for 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 the developing world uh, in terms of the issues that they uh, that are important for them in the negotiations in the WTO uh, give me some time and i will and i see isabel has raised her hand Thank you. Thank you very much. Just on the question of uh, debt relief or cancellation, uh, you are referring just to least developing countries or, for example, uh, there are countries in Latin America who, um, which would be um, eligible for debt cancellation or relief? Thank you. Well, obviously, at least the work we have done, we, we don't believe that the debt problem is unique to least developed countries. I mean, the classic case is small island economies, which are technically middle income countries, but are, are many of them, and particularly in the Caribbean, are facing huge debt burdens that require um, something more than the kind of uh, options that have been given to them by the G20 in the context of the, de uh, the debt servicing, uh, the, the, the debt service suspension initiative. So, so we don't. I mean, you know, these always it's a case by case basis. But we, we, debt problems are not unique to least developed countries. There are many middle income countries, indeed higher middle income countries, that face very serious debt uh, challenges that will require, I think, in our opinion some sort of relief beyond kicking the can down the road, which is essentially what the DSSI does. And I see we have of France 24, John Sarocostas. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit, uh, um, Secretary General, you said you support the waiver uh, for on um, on the COVID-19 vaccines. Can you elaborate a little bit more what guidance you're gonna give UNCTAD, what sort of uh, input you're gonna put in this uh, 
conversation down the street in the WTO. In the past, at least uh, under the leadership of Mr. Recupero, UNCTAD did a lot of uh, policy briefs to assist developing countries, as you mentioned earlier, to go in there prepared to be participants in the debate uh, in, the, in the rooms. So if you could elaborate what you plan going forward on this issue, and secondly, also on the very sensitive issue of agriculture, and in particular, issues concerning Sub-Sahara Africa, and in particular, the cotton issue, which to my recollections has not been given sufficient visibility by UNCTAD, even though it has a commodity division as a section. Uh, frankly, I, I still cannot answer. Uh, and I, I want to be very uh, bland uh, to say that. Uh, I will have to meet with the people that is working in these issues. I will have to see the work and the plans that they already have uh, with respect to these issues. But I take uh, your point. I will look into it in terms of agriculture, in terms of, you mentioned cotton, and I, uh, I work on that issues uh, uh, before, uh, but I cannot tell you exactly what I'm going to do. And let me let me maybe uh, send a message here. I I I I I don't come to UNCTAD having already a plan. I come to UNCTAD to understand what UNCTAD is doing, what uh, uh, the people that have been working all this time in UNCTAD have been. Uh, uh, what is their position to understand the organization, to learn from the people that is in the organization. And then I will take my decisions based on uh, the reality that I uh, encounter. Uh, it will be, I think, irresponsible from my part to tell you that I already have a plan without having been not a week <laughs> in the organization. So I will take it from here to really work with all the people in ANCTA to be able to have a plan for the future. And obviously, uh, ANCTA 15 will be a very important milestone uh, in that process. Can I just say something? Just on the waiver issue, John, because we, I mean, we, ANCTA, I mean, the trend development report obviously came out fairly early in support of the waiver i mean but you know very consciously that this, this was not a panacea this was simply a first step i think as rebecca said that you know beyond the waiver issue there is the question of technology transfer of related r d initiatives that is incredibly important if the developing world is to be able to produce vaccines itself and that is ultimately the goal here because not just in response to the COVID-19. We know that there are other pandemics coming down the road um, uh, that could be more virulent and, and developing countries don't want to find themselves in the same position when that happens that they are now, which is essentially depending on the charity of advanced economies and large pharmaceutical uh, in, uh, companies that have very different interests from their own. So, so the waiver is incredibly important as a first step towards meeting that goal of the South being able to produce its own vaccines. But, but it is only a first step that requires a number of other support measures if we're going to get the kind of um, goal that we are, reach the kind of goal that we, we, we need to, to deal with these kinds of problems. And, 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 and that's an important lesson, not only I think for, the, for, for health issues, I think it actually has implications, for example, climate related technologies, which are gonna be a critical, I'm sure a critical source of, of discussion and, and, and potentially conflict in the context of the, of the Glasgow COP. So this is, it's a very important issue, but it's not a panacea. And of course, uh, Richard Coselwright and his team of which a few are here in the room as well, remain available after the press conference as well to follow up with any questions you may have. I see that Javi has his hand up. Uh, no, I just wanted to thank uh, the Secretary General uh, for her fresh uh, breath of air that she provided 
on various things. It's so nice to, you know, once hear these views from a new secretary general compared to the dread that we've had in the past many, a couple of years at Town Tad. Thank you. And um, John, I don't know if you have a follow-up question. Your hand is up. Can you hear me, Richard? Hello? I can, John, yeah. Yes, yes. If you could elaborate a little bit, um, you mentioned in your introduction that you have concerns that uh, the recovery is uh, more subdued for sub-Saharan Africa and parts of Asia. Can you elaborate a little bit what are your concerns and what's behind these observations? Thanks. I mean, I'm, I mean, the concern is the scale of the hit that these countries have taken in the first place. I mean, the fact that they have been hit harder uh, than in the past is the is the immediate concern. I, we know that certainly in the case of sub-Saharan Africa, that country, these countries do not have the fiscal and monetary space that um, even other um, uh, middle-income developing countries have. So their capacity to respond uh, is is much weaker, and that's an obvious concern. And I and I think thirdly, and it's quite clear that the new variants of the virus seem to be hitting um, parts, certainly parts of Africa that that were not hit as from a health point of view as hard uh, by the first round of the virus are being hit much harder. Uh, this time around, by 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 the new variants of the of 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 the of the of the virus, and that that not only you know is is devastating in terms of lives lost, but it puts further pressure on health systems that are incredibly stretched. Uh, their economies are much more informal uh, uh, than than in, in many other parts of the world, and that that adds to pressures in terms of their the kinds of measures that they can take in response to this more virulent strain of the virus. And, and there's a real threat now, I think, of a vicious circle being triggered by this virus, which, which could be even more devastating than the, the first time around. Because the first time around, they were the victims of the, they were essentially, from an economic point of view, the victims of the necessary policy choices that advanced countries had to take by locking down their economies and the adverse effects that had on commodity prices, on, on capital flows, on remittances, on export revenues, etc. I think, I think if, if that is compounded by a, a more virulent health shock, then, then we could see some real devastating consequences for some countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I see no more questions. So just to repeat or remind everybody, the embargo will be lifted tomorrow, 15 September, 2 p.m. Uh, GMT, 4 o'clock Geneva time. And Richard and his team remain available uh, for further questions you may have hereafter. Thank you, SG. Thank you, Richard. And with this, we close the press conference.